So we're here now to sort of wrap up our discussion of uh, alphine modes. Well, to be uh, precise, uh, modes in a magnetized plasma, okay, which include alphine modes as well as um, the alphine modes plus fast and slow magnetosonic modes. Okay, uh, and so uh, just to reiterate, the alphine mode is, is very much like a, a wave on a string. So you, uh, that would be a stretch string, which is essentially the magnetic field line here. And you twang the string like this, you know, you have uh, transverse displacements, transverse to the direction of the string and also to the direction of propagation. And the string starts, you know, exhibiting uh, undulations like this and the wave travels in this direction with a velocity VA which is B squared over A uh, for pi over rho. This might be 4 or 8. I, I, I'm not entirely sure. Please check. And uh, so uh, th these would be the alphine waves. They are transverse waves with no density perturbations. However, these two modes, the fast and the slow magnetosonic modes, which we have uh, discussed at length. They are, you know, they are sound-like waves, okay, and uh, they are a little complex. It all depends upon the precise characteristics, uh, depend upon the direction of propagation with respect to the background magnetic field, and, and that's true for the alphine mode also, you know. Dispersion relation is omega squared equals kz squared, kz squared, va squared, okay, uh, where the kz is, uh, is uh, essentially k cosine theta. The theta is the direction between the k vector and the direction of the magnetic field. So that is true for the alphine wave also. Uh, the fact that uh, the, uh, the propagation is anisotro, well, you know, that, 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 that the theta matters. Uh, but uh, let us now, since the magnetosonic waves, the fast and the slow magnetosonic waves were slightly different, uh, let us uh, summarize, having having discussed them so far, let us summarize their properties a little bit. First of all, the main thing is the, the ratio of the alphine velocity to the sound speed. This matters. This matters greatly. Or if you will, uh, you can, you can um, uh, equivalently, the ratio of VA to CS and you can also, you know, uh, write it in terms of the plasma beta, okay? Uh, I leave you to uh, figure out how. Uh, if you remember, the plasma beta is, is uh, essentially the ratio of the magnetic pressure to the, sorry, the, the particle pressure, um, gas pressure to the magnetic pressure. Okay, so when the beta is very low, that means the magnetic pressure dominates, and when the beta is high, the gas pressure dominates. And I leave you to figure out the relation between beta and VA over CS. Okay, it's quite easy. You can just go from here and, and, and figure this out. Anyhow, so, the deal is for low beta, for beta greater than 1, okay, in other words, VA over CS less than 1, okay, the fast mode, fast mode, the fast, uh, when I say fast mode, I mean fast magnetosonic mode, okay, it is almost like a sound wave almost like a sound wave, okay, modified a bit by uh, a magnetic pressure, almost like a sound wave except it's modified by b squared over 8 pi, Mag modified by the magnetic pressure, okay. For beta less than 1, In other words, V over CS greater than 1, yeah? It propagates the speed 
the speed of the fast mode is 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 so right now we are discussing only the fast mode okay we will uh, after this we will discuss a slow mode okay the speed is is almost the alpha in velocity okay and the fluid displacement the fluid displacements are perpendicular to the to the magnetic field very much like the alpha in speed okay uh, but you know it's it's almost isotropic in other words the dispersion relation the dependence of this of, of omega and k does not contain a theta as in the dependence on theta is uh, very weak okay so in in these two as in in, in the beta less than one limit it is like the alphine waves in these two respects in that it propagates at the speed uh, uh, at the alphine speed almost uh, and the fluid displacements are also perpendicular to b so it starts looking like a transverse alphine wave however the dispersion relation is such that the theta dependence is is very weak unlike the case for an alphine wave which uh, you know uh, the dispersion relation does have a very strong uh, theta dependence okay and for the fast mode for fast mode, uh, the group velocity, uh, which is the velocity at which the energy propagate, uh, propagates, uh, the energy always propagates isotropically, not along the field or perpendicular to the field, propagates almost isotropically regardless of beta regardless of beta or regardless of the ratio of v a over c s okay so that completes our our little wrap up of uh, the fast mode now by the way all of these relations, all, all of these deductions simply follow from the dispersion relation that we have seen earlier. Okay? What I am saying here is nothing, it's simp you, you stare enough at the dispersion relation, you, you will be able to figure all these things out. Okay? These are just sort of, um, uh, all these things that I am telling you right now are just uh, convenient um, you know, uh, markers uh, to maybe for, for, uh, to remember. But other than that, everything is contained in that, in that dispersion relation that comes out of the quartic equation that we've seen earlier. Okay. Now, um, as regards to slow mode, so from now on, everything that we'll be saying has to do with the slow mode. Okay. As regards to slow mode, um, at, at low beta, it behaves like a sound wave, 1D, it's, it's like... A 1D sound wave, except it's not isotropic. Sound waves are isotropic, guided by the field. Okay, so it is very much like a sound wave in many respects in that you know um, the propagation speed is almost the sound speed and so on and so forth, except it's not isotropic, it's guided by the field. Okay. Uh, at high beta, in the other limit, at high beta, it starts looking like an uh, alphine wave. In that, displacements, uh, i.e., what I mean by that is that displacements, the fluid displacements, are perpendicular to the field, perpendicular to B, okay, uh, perpendicular to the wave vector actually, perpendicular to, um, strictly speaking, I really should say uh, wave vector, perpendicular to K, to the wave vector, okay. And regardless of the beta, okay, um, The energy, the group velocity d omega dk, the energy 
always propagates along the magnetic field. propagates along B. Okay, this is how, so you, you, you notice the big difference between the slow mode and the, and, and, the, and the fast mode with regard to energy propagation. Uh, for fast modes, uh, uh, the energy always propagates isotropically regardless of beta. Okay, in other words, it's, it has nothing to do with the magnetic field. Whereas for the slow mode, regardless of beta, the energy always propagates along the magnetic field. Okay, so so this completes our short survey of of uh, you know uh, the the different uh, modes uh, of, of propagation in a magnetized plasma. Okay, so um, now you might ask, okay, all of this is fine, you know, um, we, we talked about the sound wave, we talked about the alpha wave, we've talked about two kinds of magnetosonic waves. Now, what about it? I mean, in practical terms, why is it important in astrophysical studies? Well, really, one of the reasons this is, I, I can give you a couple of answers to that. One is, uh, many times, you know, these waves are important. It's important to identify the waves, okay, because any arbitrary disturbance is really a superposition of waves, okay. It's a superposition of waves. It's just uh, not just one kind of wave or the other. Many times there can be a mix of waves. So it's important to identify the dominant kind of wave. That's one thing. The second thing is waves dissipate, although in, in this case we're, we, we're talking about ideal MHD, so there's no scope for dissipation. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in non-ideal cases where uh, finite resistivity is present or finite viscosity is present, waves do dissipate, okay? And the dissipation leads to heating of plasma, and this is often a very important question in astrophysics. For instance, the heating of the solar corona, of the outer atmosphere of the sun. This is uh, uh, after like shall we say, two decades of research. Uh, this is still an unsolved problem. And so uh, it's important to know many times, uh, uh, you know, people resort to the existence of different kinds of waves in, in order to understand how, how uh, the solar corona is heated. Well, dissipation apart, dissipation mechanisms apart, in the first place, you need to identify which kinds of waves are you talking about, uh, and, and, and so which kinds of waves are you uh, holding responsible for the dissipation, okay? So this is one reason we need to understand waves, okay? The other reason, of course, are uh, sh uh, are shocks, as we've s said, you know, uh, shocks are very, very important in astrophysics, and so shocks slash discontinuities, right? So the question is, what kind of shock are we talking about? Are we talking about, for instance, a sonic shock? A sonic shock meaning a sonic shock arises from a situation where a piston or a driver or some object uh, exceeds the speed of sound and, and, and that can possibly lead to steepening, nonlinear steepening and the formation of a shock. So what was the characteristic speed? Uh, uh, the object, the, uh, this can happen when an object moves at a speed greater than the sound speed. Similarly, you might you might, now that we've identified two or three other kinds of speeds, three other kinds of characteristic speeds, you might say that in this case, or in, in, in you know, uh, uh, the, the, the CFMS or CSMS. So all of these are now characteristic speeds. This, this refers to the, the fast magnetosonic speed and this refers to the slow magnetosonic speed. So now if an, instead of just one kind of shock, you have the possibility of all kinds, different kinds of shocks, okay? So again, why is this important? Well, it's important because, you know, if you're talking about it, most of the time, as we've seen, uh, as we've discussed, in astrophysics, you hold shocks responsible for particle acceleration. Right? And if you're going to be holding it responsible for particle acceleration, you need to know what kind of shock you're talking about. Only then you will know what kind of jump conditions you, 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 to expect and, uh, and, and then you can go on from there. 
Okay, uh, so so because things depend upon the jump conditions. Apart from the intrinsic, uh, you know, interest in knowing what kind of shock it is, right? And now having identified uh, three more characteristic speeds, uh, we know that there can be th uh, there can be many different kinds of shocks. There can be a sonic shock. There can be an alphanic shock. There can be a fast magnetosonic shock. There can be a slow magnetosonic shock. Sometimes. And uh, an object can can exceed uh, more than one of these speeds, and then the question is, what kind of shock will form? What, what kind of shock is most likely to form? Okay, so now th these are fairly uh, you know involved questions, and we cannot possibly. I just wanted to you know motivate it, and we cannot possibly go into the details of all of these. Um, but I will try to sketch some of these details, uh, some some of these issues before we you know uh, go on. Uh, or, or at least give, give you um, at least uh, some idea of, of what to expect from the fact that we now have uh, several different kinds of characteristic speeds. Okay. So before that, uh, uh, just by way of very quick um, uh, you know, review, uh, you know, uh, how does a shock form? The shock forms, suppose you have a pressure pulse, right? And we are simply talking about hydrodynamics now. We are simply talking about how hydrodynamic shock forms. So this would be a pressure pulse in, in, in X. So uh, here what happens is simply because the pressure here is larger than the pressure here, the sound speed here Cs1 is greater than Cs2, right? So the crest uh, uh, yeah, so so the crest starts overtaking uh, the the leading edge, so it starts doing this. Okay, and so eventually there is steepening, and like the, like that. So so eventually what will happen is when the crest starts over simply because the sound speed is uh, here is larger than the sound speed here. Why, why is that? Because the pressure here is significantly larger than the pressure here. These are not small amplitude waves. These are there's not there's not a small amplitude disturbance. Rather, there's a large amplitude disturbance. Okay, so uh, uh, the wave front steepens. This this steepens, and a shock may form. So this would be the steepening of the wave front and and the possible formation of a shock. And uh, so this uh, this was like a one slide review of when a shock might form, um, and 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 uh, then what we did for 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 sonic shocks was we evaluate we we wrote down the shock jump conditions. In other words, what to expect on either side of the shock, right? We used the mass, momentum, and energy conservation equations to uh, figure this out, right? To figure out the jump conditions. In other words, um, what, uh, how much of a jump to expect in various quantities like density pressure, velocity, and so on and so forth on either side of the shock. Now, we've done this earlier, but I thought I would, I would introduce this to you in slightly different language. For instance, uh, when, we, when we employed mass conservation, we said uh, rho 1 u1 is equal to rho 2 u2, where you know, the 1s represents uh, the, the upstream condition, 2 represents the downstream condition, so on and so forth. Uh, we did this and, 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 and we, we uh, you know, so this is essentially what we did. And, and uh, when, we, when we conserve momentum, we said uh, rho 1 u1 squared plus p, I, I urge you to go back and, and look at this. Uh, uh, this is uh, rho 2. Uh, u2 squared plus p2. This is how we did it, right? And uh, when it came to uh, energy, uh, so so now another way of writing this, another way of writing this very same thing is to say that now first of all we take we take the shock propagation direction. to be x. Just for simplicity, this shock is propagating in the x direction. Now, 
mass conservation can be written as there are these two this is just notation okay this is the same as this okay so this is what i saw instead of writing this i might simply write okay which is to say this is uh, simply to say that rho 1 ux1 minus rho 2 ux2 is equal to 0. That is what this notation is telling you. The reason I am saying this is I, I just wanted to introduce this notation here. Uh, that is all. Okay. And uh, nothing uh, different. So, so for sonic shocks, mass conservation can be written as that and momentum conservation, momentum conservation can be written as rho u x square plus p equals 0. Again, this is the same as, as this. Okay. So far, we are not saying anything new. We are simply reviewing what we have already done. Okay. We are we're, we're just, you know, uh, yeah. So, so uh, there is nothing terribly new in what we are saying here. And for completeness, the energy conservation is written as, uh, as this. Uh, can be written as um, rho and now we are, we are introducing a new quantity. I'll, I'll, this is again, this is nothing different from what we have seen earlier. I will explain this uh, in a minute. Uh, plus, um, plus, it just looks different. It is really the same thing. Where? I is what is called the internal energy density and is equal to P over gamma minus 1 rho. That is the definition. Okay. So now we've what we've done so far is simply write down um, you know the um, mass, momentum, and uh, uh, energy conservation uh, uh, for for a hydrodynamic shock, and from these, from the mass, momentum, and energy conservation uh, equation, uh, we can figure out the jump conditions. Uh, the jump conditions. Uh, rho 2 over uh, rho 2 over rho 1 uh, was equal to um, I, I, I will simply write this write this once and and, 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 and write uh, write one of these expressions and then li leave it there uh, this is simply a review I, I don't want to you know um, uh, repeat everything now uh, this is just to fam just to make you familiar with the previous result. In the same spirit as what we did, we, uh, we, we first uh, reviewed you know, sound waves before going on to alphine waves and fast and slow magnetosonic waves, right? So it is in the same, same spirit. We are now reviewing uh, you know, uh, sonic shocks, which we have already done before, uh, before going on to other kinds of shocks, okay? So now, uh, so these jump conditions, same, uh, this for instance, the ratio of, of, the, of the densities is given by this. Uh, this uh, comes from, this comes from the conservation, conservation relations, conservation uh, relations. And wh which are those? The conservation relations are just these. Are, are uh, this, this, and this. So just like the uh, uh, density jump conditions, uh, you also have uh, uh, the velocity jump conditions, uh, v2 over v1, for instance. Uh, p, uh, the pressure jump conditions, so on, so forth. Okay. So this was just to sort of. Uh, 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 give you an idea and, and, and so and, and am of course 
is a sonic Mach number. equal to velocity over just the speed of sound. Okay, so now as you can suspect with the other kinds of characteristics uh, speeds which is the alphine speed, the slow and fast magnetosonic speeds, uh, you will start having different kinds of Mach numbers also. Not just a sonic Mach number, you will have an alphine Mach number, you will have a slow magnetosonic Mach number, you will have a fast magnetosonic Mach number, right. So, um, so things start getting a little a uh, little more complicated but that's okay i mean it's it, it's nothing to you know uh, uh, so uh, the, it's it's it, the, the philosophy is still the same okay so it's an it's on that kind of philosophy that we uh, focus uh, right here um, now from from hydrodynamics from while going from hydrodynamics to magnetohydrodynamics okay what happens what what changes well as we've said as we remarked a few times earlier now um, there are three more characteristic speeds that happen but as far as conservation relation goes okay these conservation relations that we just wrote down uh, what changes well mass conservation is unchanged thankfully unchanged it's the same as uh, uh, what it was, uh, you know, uh, for, for hydrodynamics, even when you do magnetohydrodynamics, right? Momentum conservation, well, what was, what was new in the momentum conservation equation when we did magnetohydrodynamics? Momentum conservation, you remember uh, that uh, in, in, uh, while, while talking about momentum conservation, the one thing that we in, uh, that was new was uh, you need to add the Lorentz force, the J cross B force, right? So this is the new thing. That that's the new wrinkle, or the new complication, if you will, where, where, when you start doing magnetohydrodynamics, right? And also, so energy conservation. Well, energy conservation. You, you need to include magnetic energy. Magnetic energy density. Okay, so that's one thing. Also, additionally, additionally, since we're doing, since we are uh, uh, dealing with uh, electric and magnetic fields, you need to uh, consider the divergence of, of B equals 0, you need to consider, right? And consider conservation. So, you need, this is a divergence constraint. And conservation of magnetic flux, which comes from the in induction equation, of course conservation of magnetic flux. So, in addition to mass conservation, which is unchanged, momentum conservation, which is technically the same equation, except we need to add Lorentz forces, okay. Again, also with energy equation, which is pretty much the same, except we need to include magnetic energy density. We also have two new constraints when we are dealing with magnetic hydrodynamics. Uh, one is the divergence constraint, which is, uh, you know, the divergence constraint on B. Uh, and uh, we also need to uh, take into account conservation of magnetic flux. So, you have to take these, these two new things plus the extra uh, extra bits in, in, in the old conservation equations uh, into, con into uh, consideration when uh, trying to derive jump conditions uh, uh, in magnetohydrodynamics. Okay, so that's it for the time being and when we resume, uh, we will start uh, writing down the conservation uh, conditions for magnetohydrodynamics. Thank you for now.